So now that we understand why ex-Confederates chose Latin America and why they chose Latin American nations like Brazil and Mexico over others, let's look at what their experiences were once they arrived at their destination of choice. And again here, I'm going to focus for sake of time just on Brazil and Mexico. So let's start with Mexico. Uh, with Mexico, immigration occurred in two phases. The first wave of immigration consisted of two parties, primarily composed of soldiers and officials who were fighting in the Western and Trans-Mississippi theaters of the Civil War. One group of immig immigrants was led by General Joe Shelby, a prominent Confederate cavalry officer from Missouri known for his tenacity in combat. The other group was led by Edmund Kirby Smith, a Confederate general who at one time was in charge of the Confederacy's Trans-Mississippi Department. Now, the decision of these men to flee to Mexico was not necessarily one influenced by recruitment or conditions in the South. They more or less broke for the Mexican border immediately after the end of hostilities out of fear that they may be imprisoned and put on trial in front of a military tribunal. Some scholars even think that these men went to Mexico because they intended on appealing to Maximilian for help in revitalizing their war against the United States. Whether this is true or not, Maximilian really had no taste for provoking a war with the United States by enlisting former rebel, rebel soldiers. So these individuals who constituted the initial wave of immigration to Mexico either returned to the United States or blended in with ex-Confederates who set up settlements in central Mexico, which sprung up as a result of the second phase of immigration to Mexico. The second phase of immigration to Mexico, which resulted from Max, Matthew Fontaine Mare and Maximilian's recruitment efforts, began in late 1865, but reached its peak in the spring of 1866. Ex-Confederate Sterling Price and John B. Magruder were commissioned as land surveyors by Mare and Maximilian and identified an abundance of land midway between Veracruz and Mexico City, mostly in the vicinity of present-day Cordoba, as a site for potential sediments. Sterling Price informed Mare that the area was, quote, the most delightful climate and finest soil, end quote, he had ever seen. As soon as surveys of the area was complete, Mare began selling the land to ex-Confederates immigrants for $1 per acre. Mare's surveyors mapped out five ex-Confederate settlements in the vicinity of Cordoba. Carlota, which was named after Maximilian's wife, the Empress of Mexico, was by far the largest and most successful. But ex-Confederate colonies were also set up in San Luis Potosí, Durango, and Chihuahua, but none were as prosperous as the ones near Córdoba. Satisfied with the location of these new ex-Confederate settlements in fertile territory, Mari wrote to his wife, who was still in the United States in early 1866, that Córdoba was, quote, his new Virginia. But unlike the plantation society from which these ex-Confederates came, the path to prosperity for ex-Confederate planters in Mexico, especially in Cordoba, would not be based on cotton. Rather, the plantations that sprung up in Mari's New Virginia were primarily based upon co coffee cultivation. Coffee, given its high demand and profitability rate in the 1860s, was seen as the crop that would lead Southerners back to the socioeconomic position that they so desired to reclaim. And so by 1866, Historians estimate that ex-Confederate ex settlements in Mexico combined for no less than a population of 5,000 people. In relation to Brazil, most people did not leave the south of Brazil until 1867. But from 1867 to about early 1869, there was a gradual flow of southerners from the south to Brazil. Most people arrived in Rio de Janeiro, the capital of Brazil at that time where they spent a couple of days at the Confederate Hotel before departing for settlements in various parts of Brazil. Several settlements were set up near Rio de Janeiro, but they were also set up in the state of Sao Paulo, on the Brazilian frontier, in such areas as the Rio dos Valley, and the state of Espírito Santo, or farther north and into the interior in states such as Amazonia, Recife, and Pernambuco. But just to give you a sense of the size of these settlements that sprang up throughout Brazil, by the end of 1867, there were 200 ex-Confederates in Paraná, 800 in Sao Paulo, 200 in Rio de Janeiro, 100 in Minas Gerais, 400 in Espírito Santo, 100 in Bahia, 70 in Pernambuco, and 200 in Para. So when you juxtapose that with Mexico, there were certainly more settlements in Brazil, but they weren't as densely populated as the settlements in Mexico. Some people, though, actually remained in the city of Rio de Janeiro after they arrived to Brazil instead of going to one of the many settlements that sprang up. 
These were mostly people with professional skills, especially doctors who managed to set up successful business practices in the city. For example, an ex-confederate from Montgomery, Alabama, Dr. John Washington Keyes, established a dentist's office in downtown Rio de Janeiro, which became very successful. His partner, another ex-confederate, William Coachman, actually became the personal dentist to Emperor Don Pedro II and his family. Much like the colonies in Mexico, the ex-Confederate colonies in Brazil were agrarian-based. Southerners wanted to grow coffee and cotton, which they saw as the, prof as the most profitable crops to grow in Brazil. These, com these communities were also geographically isolated, and settlers attempted to maintain their Southern identity through cultural isolation as well. Ex-Confederates deliberately did not learn Portuguese or really interact with Brazilian neighbors out of concern they would gradually lose their Southern identity if they did so. Ex-Confederates are also not fond of Brazil's multiracial population and large free black, free black population, which served as another reason as to why Southerners cut themselves off to mainstream society in Brazil. Now, in both settings, Confederate expatriation went about pretty smoothly early on, and ex-Confederate settlers had moderate success in cultivating settlements and cultivating cash crops. But that soon came to an end. While settlement efforts in Mexico, again, initially found some success, things quickly turned sour for settlers in late 1866. Maximilian's war with Benito Juarez turned south, and all the expendable capital the imperial state had was directed to their war effort. And this is extremely important because Maximilian offset living costs in ex-Confederate settlements in the Cordoba Valley as farmers waited for their first coffee crops to mature. Coffee is a very slow-growing crop that requires a maturation period of three years before it produces a harvest that can be sold at market. So in the meantime, ex-Confederates expected Maximilian's government to subsidize the cost of living and the initial expense of building new settlements from the ground up. And so the lack of financial support that occurred because Maximilian had to revert, uh, divert, divert resources rather to the front lines contributed to settlements that severely lacked adequate housing. For example, most homes in Carlota were temporary constructions and consisted of straw roofs. But the idea was that ex-Confederates would not have to live in these new homes long while new homes were being built with the resources provided by Maximilian, but those never came. Inadequate housing and infrastructure expose settlers to a multitude of mosquito-borne illness, illnesses and other ailments such as cholera and dysentery, which claim the lives of many settlers. Famine-like conditions also set in in the Cordova colonies due to the fact that most agricultural production was devoted to coffee cultivation. Furthermore, any available government rations were sent to imperial troops on the front lines of the Civil War, leaving ex-Confederate settlers to fend for themselves. These conditions alone brought ex-Confederate immigration to a screeching halt in late summer of 1866. But, in addition to this, as Benito Juarez's Republican forces pushed further south, ex-Confederate settlements increasingly became subject to raids. For example, John Newman Edwards, a Confederate expat from Missouri, his hacienda was raided in April 1866, which forced him to, quote, abandon the half-tilled land and the half-matured crops and all, end quote. On June 1st, 1866, another raid occurred, but this time Carlota was targeted, the largest and most profitable ex-Confederate settlement in the Cordoba region. Around 1,000 Mexican Juaristas descended on the settlement, causing great damage and abducting around 100 ex-Confederates who were marched into the mountains and held for ransom. The latter were freed, and the Juaristas were hunted down by neighboring French imperial troops, but really, after this raid, most ex-Confederates decided it was better to go back to the South and avoid getting killed, rather than remain in Mexico with Benito Juarez's imperial forces bearing down on them. So in other words, they basically saw Maximilian was about to be defeated and decided to get out before things got bad. Considering they were subjects of the emperor, many believed that they might be put in front of a firing squad for supporting an usurper. And so by early 1867, most ex-Confederates had returned to the South, and with Maximilian's defeat and execution in the summer of 1867, the Confederate expatriation movement to Mexico was all but over. Unlike the colonies in Mexico, most of the colonies in Brazil never really got off the ground. The Brazilian government did not follow through on its promises to ex-Confederate immigrants in terms of financial subsidies, 
most likely because the Brazilian government was engaged in its own costly war in South America, the War of the Triple Alliance. This was a problem for Southerners arriving to Brazil more or less destitute. And because ex-Confederate farmers were cash-stripped from the get-go, they could not invest in slavery, and therefore their agricultural endeavors, save a few wealthy individuals, never really got off the ground. This was further compounded by the fact that the Brazilian government failed to build railroads to ex-Confederate settlements as promised, which left colonists without supply lines and forced farmers to transport cotton and other cash, crop, cash crops over mere footpaths. And this could be quite difficult to travel during the rainy season especially. On top of this, the settlements in the hinterlands where conditions were harsh resulted in many settlers dying or becoming so impoverished that they were forced to return to Rio de Janeiro in hopes of coming up with enough cash to find their way back to the United States. For example, in the Rio de Valley, many settlers could not maintain livestock because jaguars, pumas, and other predators native to Brazil carried them off. ex confederate settlers subsisted off of monkeys and toucans in order to survive. So ex confederates in these areas also struggled because they lived in shacks that did not protect them from the elements very well. They were subject to a near nonstop plague of feasting insects. And so many settlers, in addition to famine, died from malaria and other insect-related illnesses. All of this was made worse in 1868 when an uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically hot and dry weather occurred throughout Brazil. Most ex-Confederate crops that summer did not survive, leading to a famine among many settler, settlements, especially in those frontier settlements, that were not easily accessed and therefore supplied. And so by 1870, most ex-Confederate settlements in Brazil had failed, and those who were lucky enough to survive appealed to the United States government for help uh, in a trip back to the South. Henry W. Hillard, the U.S. diplomat to Brazil during this period, he was a former Confederate general, played a huge role in the return of thousands of Southerners who left the South for Brazil. Hillard worked closely with the American Benevolent Society in Rio de Janeiro to rescue many families, including donating his own money to assist in the rescue of some of the worst cases. So all in all, the Confederate expatriation movement to Latin America was basically done by 1870 with a few holdouts. <laughs>